Hey, everybody, it's the Plant Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. So happy to have you with me today to discuss what is going on with the plant based innovation business sector. Now, there's lots of opinions floating around, some from Bloomberg, some from the Wall Street Journal, some from other uh, publications. Some positive, some negative, lots of negative of late. Let's see if we can make sense of this, why it would be, if there's any actual validation to this. Do they have good points? Do they not have good points? Are we a fad? Are we a trend? What's the long-term vision for the sector? How is plant-based business faring today? And what are the next steps? So I bring on industry experts to join me today for a really kind of special plant-based business hour. Uh, and we want your comments, so give them to us, everyone. I want to bring on the CMO of Change Foods, Irina Gary, and the founder of the Vegan Women's Summit, Jenny Stoikovich. Both of you, thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having us. Ready to okay. rally. Ready to rally. So let's talk about it. Level set here. There has been a string of negative publications about the plant-based industry of late. In particular, there was a Bloomberg article basically saying that the trend is no longer and that this is merely a fad. So I'm wondering what the two of you think of this and if you have any um, comments that you'd like to make about that article or other articles in particular. And of course, I have many comments myself. Uh, Irina, I'll start with you. What did you think about that Bloomberg article? And where do you think we are today as a plant-based sector? Yeah, well, I took a deep sigh um, when I saw that. Um, and I want to start by saying that, you know, plant-based sector has had its problems, right? In general, right now, we're going through inflationary period. People are looking at really quite high prices in food and plant-based has already been higher than most other food. And so people are cinching their pocketbooks. And I think that's hitting the sector in general, plant-based across the board. And the other thing to note is obviously it's still a very nascent sector. So the market share is quite small. It's a percent and a half or so. And when you see somebody declared a fad after just literally three years in market, you kind of wonder, why is that, right? So to me, that was like the first thing. And so then I read the article and there are some fair bits and points about growth trajectories that maybe didn't pan out as hoped. And um, now the growth is not coming in as fast as it was. That said, I think the article missed a number of really big points, specifically around why this category absolutely must exist um, and what can be done going forward in order to make it a success. Because let's be honest here, we could not continue with the status quo of industrial meat, right? So to me, those were like massive things. And I know we're going to talk about that, but that, that, that was my big conclusion is what a miss. Mm -hmm. Jenny, what do you think? Totally going to echo what both of you all are saying. So this article had the ability to be so much more than it was, mm -hmm. especially if we're going to use real estate, like the cover of Bloomberg Business Week. The fact that it was such a miss on so many key topics, I was shocked. I was honestly quite shocked. The fact that this article largely, it was about 80% Beyond Meat data that was shared, which let's say on a good day, when Beyond, you know, when Beyond Meat's really having a good day, they're maybe two and a half percent of the entire plant-based industry worldwide. That's what most of the data was. There's a little bit of impossible in there, but obviously impossible is a private company, so you can't gather the same amount of information. But to declare an entire global industry dead or a fad over one single stock ticker, it's absolutely mind boggling. You know, as I've said earlier, you know, in our conversations over the last few months, there's a lot of industries that have some pretty nasty tickers going around right now. I mean, we could say social media is dead if we go based off of Snapchat losing 90 percent, uh, go based off of Meta losing almost 70 percent of their of their um, valuation in the last year. So, yeah, things are a little tough at Beyond Meat right now. And that happens. That happens with startups. The fact of the matter is less than one percent of all startups even make it to an acquisition or to an exit or to IPO. Yeah, I, I agree. There's so much to, to say there. I thought the article was so one-sided that 
towards the middle, it was hard to take it seriously because it was 24 paragraphs without one counterpoint. So it's one thing to say retail statistics, which makes sense from my perspective. People are back to work. So of course, they're not going to buy as much groceries because they're back eating at their corporate cafeteria or they're going out to dinner with friends. Now that restaurants are open, kids are out of the house, they're back at universities. So they're eating at university cafeterias. So it makes sense to me that the retail numbers have shifted. There's no discussion really about food service, how, um, you know, at least according to Dot Foods, 38% increase 2022 over 2021 for the first three quarters of the year because restaurants are all feeling the need after COVID that they must have at least one plant based option. This is reiterated from Data Essentials saying that now 48% of all restaurants have one plant based option, up from 30%. So to talk about food and a sector as a trend or a fad and not address restaurants. They addressed some fast casual, but they didn't address anything else like cafeterias and, and other food service. Seems like not real journalism, actually, to tell you but, the truth. But, you know, just to counterbalance this a little bit, right? What is fair is, yes, prices are high. And yes, consumers okay. are trading down. That's true. And, and yes, the consumption patterns are shifting from grocery to away from home. But even if you just compare, you know, conventional animal-based meat to plant-based meat, right? Both are slightly down. Conventional meat's down a couple percentage points, but plant-based meat specifically is tanked, right? Like it went down 18 or 20 percent in grocery. So even comparatively speaking, if you say, look, people are doing all these other things, there's still an issue there, right? And I think let's dive in to say what is happening and why is it happening? Also placing in the context of, I think just really high expectations. And I think the stock market really punishes not just when you, you know, maybe don't grow as much, right? But most important is that when you promise and expect this hyper growth, as they have seen in the last few years of solid double digits, and now all of a sudden you're single digits or negative, that's the scandal, right? If you look at Oatly, same things happen to Oatly, but there's a bigger category of publicly traded plant-based milk companies out there. And plant-based milk is down to a few percentage points, but nowhere near as much as Oatly stock, right? And yet we're not writing off the entire plant-based milk category, but we're seemingly writing off the entire plant-based meat category. So there are these weird inconsistencies, even though there's reality in the data that something is happening there that the growth is not coming in and it's declined. Although I, I would even take issues the wrong word, but I would add context to this. When we say year over year, that's, you know, we don't even have really 2022 over 2021 yet. At least it's not out from the Good Food Institute and the Plant-Based Foods Association, which did today have a response to the Bloomberg article and other articles. But, you know, you're still coming off of that COVID high. If you remember in June of 2021, I speak for this household, all of our family travel was canceled. We had to stay home and eat, could not go traveling. So then you look at 2022 where we wouldn't get off a plane. I mean, we were just never home. So that travel schedule just in and of itself, 2021 is still almost a COVID year. It's not 2020, like we saw that incredible growth, but you, you know, 2021 is still staying home and eating a lot. So I think these are weird times mm -hmm. to look at when you use 2020 and 2021 COVID years as your benchmark. And nobody understands a benchmark like Bloomberg, which is why um, that was a little bit uh, disappointing. But I don't know, Jenny, what do you think? So two points. The first one to your point, Elizabeth, is we also need to consider people's wallets here, right? Mm. The era of the pandemic was very different to different types of people. And given the stimulus, certainly up in Canada from a retail perspective, there was a massive amount of expenditures that people were able to make that they're not able to make now because we've had record inflation. We've had a war started since. And a lot of the stimulus money has gone away. And that allowed for people to make, you saw that in a lot of different categories. You saw cannabis surging, you saw alcohol surging, you know, expensive, experimental, different foods, plant-based meats, yeah. things like that. All of a sudden, you know, they were something that people were considering and experimenting with, right? So I think that's one thing we need to also think about um, from an economic perspective. But the other thing we should uh, talk about to Irina's point is, okay, let's talk about growth here. The fact that we are building food companies in a VC backed startup manner in the first place is pretty freaking insane. Like, let's be clear. This is not how the food companies of yesteryear were built, right? The meat industry 
in the United States of America, what, it's the biggest meat capital in the entire world, is more than a century old. Actually, this year, uh, right now, 2023, is officially the 100-year anniversary of inventing factory farming in the United yeah. States. So the amount of money that has gone into building those industries, most of which they got land from homesteading acts of the 1800s to slowly amalgamate much of that um, space they now use for beef that they would never be able to afford now, we don't have any of that. We have these companies that have to raise in a VC environment because the government's not providing the same infrastructure that it provided to meat and other agricultural commodities. Right. And that's 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 the expectations, right? When you're funded by venture capital, especially when a lot of the companies are located in the Bay Area and they have the same venture capital money that's funding tech. And let's be honest, the tech is much easier to scale than food. Mm -hmm. It's much faster. There's not the acid base. You don't need the factories. You don't need to produce real things, right? You can iterate on multiple versions of your software. We don't have the luxury. So the dynamics of the business are different. And yet the expectations, again, I think were just too high, right? We, we thought this is going to be this hockey stick immediately. We're going to come and they will love us and everybody will buy it. And price is a massive impact. There is still a slight trade-off, although I would say impossible and beyond are really darn close, but there's still a taste trade-off. And I would say, let's talk about this whole processed idea, because I feel like that's created okay. so much headwind <laughs> for this category unfairly. And yet that's there. Like, I don't think we can ignore the elephant in the room where some of the early adopter consumers are kind of scratching their head and saying, well, I came into plan-based for health and is this undeniably better for me? And I think that is driving a lot of the slowdown in the growth. Okay, before we get to health, because I want to get there, there's so much to unpack there. I want to just round out your conversation where you're saying this unnatural expectation, because that's what VCs do, right? They, they want the unicorn, the pie in the sky, the go big or go home, which is not slow growth and building the foundation and the infrastructure, but more like wham, bam, give it to me fast. So we have this unnatural expectation. But at the same time, Jenny, you're talking about, you know, getting land for free and these kind of, kind of external costs that the meat industry doesn't have to pay. Not only do they have subsidies, but the damage that they do, and this is one of the great things coming out of COP27, where we saw this constant concept of damage and loss sticking. And that concept, for those who don't know, is those countries, those large countries that are creating the damage, are now going to have to pay for the loss that smaller countries are experiencing because of the greenhouse gas emissions that these large countries emit. Same thing is going to hold true for companies, I believe. This concept is going to stick where you just can't dump your externalities on us, eutrophication, the dirtying of water, taking up too much land, taking up uh, too much deforestation. 41% of the world's tropical deforestation happens because of animal agriculture. So these external costs are not having to be counted in the competitor's books. Uh, and we are up against that. Um, but in mentioning the competitors, I want to see if I can bring up an article here from, I believe it's the Wall Street Journal, that started talking about, so sorry for my eyes moving around, folks. I've got so many articles um, that I want to bring up. Ah, here we go. In clampdown on U.S. methane, hopefully everybody can see this. Um, cool. Everybody can see it. Great. Okay. In clampdown of... U.S. Hold on. Just want to get rid of something so everybody can read it. Um, on U.S. methane emissions, belching cattle get a pass. So this article in the Wall Street Journal was from February of 2022. COP 2026 was in November of 2021. And after that COP where people protested saying, how can you talk about climate change without talking about animal agriculture? You saw a slew of articles, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, sort of January to March. And then I note, because I think the timing is interesting, that's when you really started to see the bashing about the plant-based sector once the meat industry had taken some heat. So I wonder if this competitor is starting to put in some big dollars to push the negative messaging about plant-based meat. Any thoughts there, folks? I think it's turf defense, right? So before even attacking plant-based meat, as you rightfully mentioned, we're looking at the climate bigger picture, right? We're saying, look, yes, we need to reduce fossil fuel emissions 100%. I think that's everybody's clear. But right behind it is agriculture. 
And in agriculture, methane is the biggest menace, right? In fact, it's 84, 86% more powerful at warming yes. the planet than CO2. So we have to address methane and addressing methane is actually more impactful in the short term because it's a short-lived, very powerful gas. So immediately you land on animal agriculture because it actually is the leading source of global methane emissions ahead of oil and gas mm -hmm. and coal industry, right? So that puts the meat industry on the back foot because that is part of their production system. It's not like oil and gas where you could plug a hole. There's no hole plugging here uh, to, to be, uh, you know, specific. And so that puts them on the back. And so we're seeing lobbying efforts. We're seeing um, efforts across the globe to divert the conversation away from animal agriculture, to distract, to make sure there's not even a measuring system in place to measure those emissions. And then as a byproduct of this larger effort, I think because plant-based meat alternatives specifically don't have any methane emissions, you want to squelch your competition because it offers a solution without yeah. going to the nth degree of complexity with, you know, biogas digesters and seaweed extracts and all of this yet to be proven technology. But you could say, look, or you can just cut down the cow population and solve your methane problem. Nobody wants to talk about that. So a hundred percent, I think it's totally related to the bigger picture pressure from climate yeah, and that's one of the things that was missing in this article. I know, Jenny, you've got stuff to come on down as well, but um, no real understanding from this article or other critical articles about the why behind plant-based options and how that will push max, mass adoption. What do you think, Jenny? So to add to Irina's point, this is just one in a slew of different attacks that we have had in, with the animal egg space in terms of trying to divert away from the attention paid. Uh, one that I'll point folks to just to give you an example of an earlier, um, an earlier case where this happened. Does anyone remember the drought? Remember the almonds in the drought? Remember that yeah. back in 2015? It was the exact same thing. Dairy, as you know, Irina, you say quite often you speak a lot about California's dairy industry and how powerful it is. And um, we're one of the biggest dairy states. They completely diverted. Yeah, there you go. So they completely diverted the conversation towards almonds. And still to this day, you can actually trace it back to a Mother Jones piece in 2015 that was put out to shame almond milk. And that has been the going rhetoric for years now. I just spoke to my friend Maggie Baird last week. She was doing um, a campaign and people were, her fans actually wrote into her and said, my parents told me that almonds are, are bad. Is that yeah. true? Mm -hmm. You know, like Billie Eilish's fans are hearing this as well. And so I think this is not a new tactic. We've seen it evolve. Sometimes it's like, it's not the cow, it's the how or, right. you know. Yeah. Um, you know, they're a new trope every single time. It's the same thing every single time. And what it comes back down to is sowing doubt in the consumer. Because when you sow doubt in the consumer, the consumer just says, I don't know what to do. So I will just do the status quo. And the status quo for most people, unfortunately, in this country is to buy animal products. Mm -hmm. It's what they know. And people do what they know. And in response or in fairness to the consumer, who could make heads or tails of this? I mean, I think that's what a lot of the negative campaigning is supposed to do is to confuse the consumer and yes. to put that doubt in their mind. So when animal agriculture knows that it's going to have SEC regulation coming down where it's going to have to disclose, remember this concept of, of damage and loss, you're not going to get away with dumping on your, your, your externalities on everyone else. So you're going to have to start disclosing how many trees you cut down, what kind of impact you have in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And they know that that pressure is coming. They're going to look bad. So they're starting to, di to divert everyone's attention to some really funky, funky ads. I'm trying to find, oh, here I think it is. Let me see if I can upload a recent ad that to me, looks more, and this is from a Center for Consumer Freedom, which is funded by the meat industry. Let's see if I can. But not just meat, this. founded by Big Tobacco, Philip Morris themselves. Founded by, um, what do you mean founded by? You mean the organization was founded by? Literally, that's the money that started the entire organization was directly from Philip Morris, the whole thing. It was originally only going to be smoking. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they went on to take on big meat. And I think they also represent take on big meat as a client. So tobacco, big meat, alcohol. I'm trying to find this um, uh, screenshot and I'm, I'm not able to pull it up. I'm having some technical difficulties, but if you'd like to go to the center for consumerfreedom.org, you can pull it up yourself and see what I mean. So um, it's, it's been an all out really, I'd almost say sort of like a slander campaign. That's not to say that Arena's points about, yeah, these are tricky times and people are, you know, eating out more and maybe they're, they've tried it once and maybe they felt like, oh, I'll just wait till the next version of plant-based comes out. I mean, that's something we haven't even talked about, about how early stages of innovation we are. Think of that cell phone when like, you had to like buy a separate purse or a separate briefcase because you're like, oh God, wait, I got to bring my cell phone with me. You know, it's so big. So we haven't even gotten to anything that is, really a perfect product, let alone price parity. Let's so- talk about why this is, why these strategies are deployed, right? What Jenny's saying, why are they working? It's literally, you know, if you rewind 30 years of fossil fuel industry playbook, it's the same playbook, right? First you deny, and we're seeing that. Yes. Let's not measure emissions. Let's not uh, regulate them in any sort of way. In fact, there's a straight up denial campaign where there's paid spokespeople and, you know, uh, paid scientists to say, oh, methane from cows is different than methane from fossil fuels. I'm like, folks, it's the same molecule. But they're trying to say, oh, it's it's somehow different, right? It doesn't warm the planet. It does. Um, so deny, right? Deflect. Let's point the arrows back to fossil fuels. Let's point the arrows to plastics. Let's talk about wind turbines. Anything other than what we're talking about. I'm seeing this daily where you're trying to talk about sustainability and people come and debate commas and nomenclature with you more than the subject of the conversation, right? They do not want to talk about this. Let's uh, delay. We will talk about net zero by 20, whatever. We will talk about hopes and dreams of reducing emissions without making any concrete plans, right? We will point to unproven strategies like methane, you know, reducing seaweed additives that are yet to be scaled or really deployed and, you know, regenerative agriculture that is yet to be defined or standardized or or really scaled in any meaningful way. But we will talk about all these things and we will deploy the, you know, the people in cowboy hats that we all have affinity for uh, by living in this country to be the spokespeople to put all this information out. And as you said, Jenny, the the sole intent is to confuse, right? Because to an average consumer who doesn't read the details on methane chemistry or IPCC reports or any of that stuff, they will hear something on TikTok or on Twitter and whatever. And they're like, oh, my God, I don't know. Meat was good. Meat was bad. I don't understand it. And then you layer on the smear campaign with the processing, with the Bill Gates microchips, with Um, you name it, crazy stories that stick, right? And as at the end of the day, you get a consumer base who initially started to come with you, who is now saying, well, I'm not totally sure. Yeah, I can't keep up. Is all you have to do. You don't actually have to be right. Just this confused. is what lawyers do. Yes, they just, all you have to do is see doubt. You don't mm-hmm. actually have to prove right or wrong. You just have to prove reasonable doubt. And so now people are utterly confused and I can't ask the random consumer to dive into it and to have to do a research analysis every time they try to feed, a single mother tries to feed her, you know, three kids at the dinner table. It has to be fast. It has to be convenient. It has to taste good. It has to be affordable and they have to like it. So, you know, you can't really ask more for people than that. I just finally was able to pull up... Um, I'll share my screen again. I was able to pull up the Center for Consumer Freedom just so people can see what kind of bias that we're talking about and um, how really trying to slant the conversation. So a lot of this really um, out to just slander. I really don't know a better word to say, slander. But, um, but, oh, go ahead. So this is the Center for Consumer Freedom, the site you're looking at right now, you know, for folks that have never seen this before, you actually have seen this before because your cousin in middle America has told you something that they've said, right? Um, this is so pervasive, the messaging that they have done. And it all started, um, they've had many, many different battles, but it really all started to heat up when Beyond had their big IPO. You and I have talked about this a million times, Elizabeth. 
a lot of people were surprised that it was the biggest IPO in two decades. Uh, you know, they had a less than $100 million a year in, in sales when it happened. Maybe it was a little too early. Maybe there were a little, you know, a few things that were um, a bit of a um, hype around that stock. But the reality is that they noticed when that happened. And you can trace back when that exact moment happened to when a massive uptick in this kind of rhetoric started. And it all culminated at the Super Bowl. Months after Beyond's IPO, the Super Bowl had a $5 million ad about plant-based meats being scary and synthetic. Mm -hmm. How much more obvious could it be? Yeah, and I think there's a lot of things that happened around that time frame. First of all, markets are forward-looking, so they like to see novel innovations. But um, they're... I don't know when I want to say that it was hype around it. I mean, you see the hype around something like Rivian. So there's, there are barely any cars in the market and that's worth, you know, they have no revenue basically. And no one's dissing Amazon, which is what um, is affiliated with Rivian. And so, you know, we, and we look at like NVIDIA in 2022 mm -hmm. and their stock was down 60 to 70%. No one thinks CEO Jensen Wang is anything but a brilliant visionary. So um, there's been sort of an unlogical focus on this, but I, I, I do think that going back to Arena's point about um, health, I do think health is what has captured the consumer's mm -hmm. um, preoccupation. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about what health benefits there are and what health benefits there aren't. I'll start by saying, and I've got a great article that I'll pull up in a second when you guys are talking, um, you know, health, it, it's not a black and white situation. So it's not healthy or unhealthy. Mm -hmm. It's a spectrum of healthy. So sure, you can have animal agriculture, you know, factory f animals being the worst, and then you move to grass fed, and then you move to burgers that are plant based, and then you move to like veggie burgers, and then you move to like a homemade bowl with rice and beans, and then you move to, to raw food. So somewhere in there, you have the spectrum of health, and no one's moving to raw vegan. So, you know, is a Beyond Meat burger a carrot? No, but it doesn't have trimethylene and oxide, which is awful and an inducer of heart disease. It doesn't have um, cholesterol, antibiotics, hormones, uh, animal heme. So there's a lot to say it is better, but big meat has really focused on the fact that it is in a box and it does have a barcode and it is processed. And I find this galling because big meat is the OG of processed meat. They defined the category with bacon, deli slices, sausages, hot dogs. These are class one carcinogens, according to the World Health Organization. So it's the media rampage that they've run with, which is so funny because they're the originators of processed meat. What do you guys think? 100% agree. I wrote a, actually an op-ed. So if you guys wanted to Read the details, and I linked to a bunch of these studies and, um, on Green Queen. Uh, it was called, is plant-based plant meat overhyped or plant-based burger overhyped? So take, take a look if you want the data. But 100% agree with you, Elizabeth. I will say that I think it comes down a lot to how we perceive food versus what it actually is, right? Because mm -hmm. there's good evidence to say that, A, not all processing is the same and not all processing is bad. Putting beans in a can is a form of processing, right? Making guacamole is a yes. form of processing. Canning is, so we can talk about this. That said, there is a, a real concern with hyper-processed industrialized food, such as Twinkies and, you know, Gatorade, et cetera, that takes out the positive side of nutrients and brings in the negative, right? So yes, there's processing that is not positive. I agree with you, Elizabeth, meat, Red meat specifically is a known problematic food because of the TMAO, because of um, hello saturated fats. Nobody's cares that science, you know, cholesterol, etc. And processed meat is a known carcinogen. As you said, bacon, it's almost like cigarettes in terms of your health impact. Nobody should be fooled by deli meats, breakfast sausages, etc. And yet I think there is this perception in our mind that because we've been eating this for a while and yeah. we don't see people dropping dead immediately after consuming the food, there's this lack of connection in our understanding between long-term impact that food has on cancer, on diabetes, on heart disease, et cetera. And there's now this narrative in a public space that anything with multiple ingredients or anything where the ingredients have been processed is automatically bad. So you have these simplistic narratives 
combined with, well, we've been eating steaks forever, so how bad could they be, right? Leading consumers to kind of question, but I agree with you 100%, and there's good evidence to say that compared to animal-based counterparts, not to kale, but to, <laughs> to meat, right, that these foods are either parity or better. I don't think there's a reasonable study or article that pulls in nutrition information that says, oh, it's way worse than, than the equivalent, right? So it's parity or better. Is it processed? Yeah, kind of. But who doesn't eat processed food in this country? Hello. I mean, yes, I love my whole food plant-based people, but there are like five of them, I think, that could stick to it consistently. So a hundred percent. And I, I want to hear from Jenny on this too, but I'll, I'll just say it's very comical to me almost. And sometimes when I go to the C Center for Consumer Freedom, it is because, you know, I don't have time to watch Saturday Night Live. So I go to that site instead. I mean, it's comical to me because all of this conversation, and it was brought up in the recent Bloomberg article as well, that plant-based isn't healthy compared to the benchmark of one of the unhealthiest foods out there. Just spoiler alert that maybe we should remind people, hamburger is not a health food. So when did it? Uh, when did a hamburger ever become this standard that, oh my gosh, if we go to, to plant-based hamburgers, we've left our natural and good and healthy hamburgers. Hamburgers are not a health food by any stretch of the imagination. Jenny, what do you think? So... Yes, double click on everything that y'all said. It's really funny that we're having this conversation because literally yesterday we had one of our vegan women summit tweets go viral that was, it's always the guy who wakes up and has Mountain Dew for breakfast that tells you vegan food is too processed. Because that's not <laughs> like, let's, you know, we there's the person we think we are and then there's the person that we actually are, right? Consumers, they don't largely pay attention to what they're eating. The average consumer, I think at this point is now spending 13 seconds reading a label at the store, deciding whether they're gonna buy it. That's better than we, I thought. We, we really don't eat that well in this country. And uh, recent studies actually showed, do you know what percent of Americans are getting their daily fruits and vegetable intake, the recommended oh, intake? Like two? Yeah. Okay. You're such a nice. Like, all right. Well, okay. Elizabeth. Like maybe seven. <laughs> okay. Ten percent. Oh yeah. well. Okay. See, we're doing better than <laughs> more than ten people, and they're almost all women, by the way. Women are um, yeah. like sixty percent more likely than men to be getting their their daily intake. Right. We're not eating kale instead of meat. Right. Like we're not doing it. A Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger. They're a substitute for a hamburger. And one of the things that I actually find so jarring about this is that we established a very, very long time ago with conclusive evidence that red meat causes heart disease. The fact that we are relitigating it decades later is absolutely unreal. In 1977, the United States put the new dietary guidelines out and updated for the first time in history that red meat was linked to heart disease. And that is why, folks, you can go look this up the top year that we've ever consumed red meat and beef ever in the US was 1976. Because when the new dietary guidelines came out, there was a precipitous drop, just an absolute cliff drop because Americans found out, oh no, this heart disease epi epidemic that I'm now seeing in my friends and family has to do with the crazy amount of beef that we now suddenly can eat in these last few decades, right? Um, that's actually why they invented chicken. That's why they invented the, the chicken nugget, right? Um, in 1976, McDonald's hired the queen's chef to come in and spend seven years to invent the McNugget because Big Mac sales were just torpedoing, right? So it's unreal that we have somehow come full circle 50 years later, and we're somehow talking about established data. Yeah. What is going on? You know? Yeah. The other thing is, I think we're often extrapolating way too far. Like Elizabeth, you said, health is not one food healthy or unhealthy. Nobody eats one food all day long, right? We are all eating a variety of foods. Yes, we tend to consume, you know, our habitual foods, but it's always a variety. So I'll eat impossible but I might have a great salad for breakfast or a wonderful veg dish on the side, or I might have eaten perfectly wonderfully for five days a week and the burger is my Friday night 
treat, right? So I think when we try to paint these foods with either one or the other, we're ignoring the fact that that's not how humans eat. Nobody is perfect. Everybody needs a bit of treats and processed food and whatever in their in their life, I think. Um, and again, I give I eat this. I, I give this to my kids. I have absolutely zero concern for how processed it is. Right. Because it comes in context of a very healthy, very whole food, vegetable forward diet. And I think sometimes we kind of fight ourselves over, you know, is this healthy or not? No, it's not the most healthy food. Get over it. Go eat some kale salad on the side. Right. Like, yeah. What is it? End of, end of debate. So much to unpack there. So uh, just a couple of things uh, before we go. First of all, Jenny talking about the chicken McNugget coming on. So just FYI, folks, a chicken McNugget is not a health food either. So no. if that's your benchmark yeah. for health, that's Are not going to work. Me? I know. I just, Jenny I lives on that. In that paper article, they said, you know, I fed my kids nuggets every day. I thought they were healthy. Shocking. Well, Incredible. So when we have all this meat consumption, what you're really seeing, and everyone's so focused on protein, but what you're really seeing is fiber deficiency in the United States. And so we talk about the rise of diabetes and the rise of uh, heart disease, but also it's the rise of colorectal cancer because you have this very long digestive tract eating something, large quantities of it that has no fiber. So it doesn't move through the track. It sits there. And that is impetus for um, cancer, usually colorectal cancer. So what all of this sums up to me when they try to confuse the consumer is that this article recently of late, but also all of the negative things that have been put out is so anti-consumer because consumers love choice. Just walk down the chip aisle. Is it salted? Is it not salted? Is it whole grain? Is it fried? Is it baked? Is it in a bag? Is it in a, does it stand up straight? I mean, look at the bread aisle. Is it whole wheat or is it, does it have crust? Is it white? Is it, mm -hmm. consumers like choice. Why can't consumers have meat, plant-based meat and a salad? Why can't they have all of it? It's funny because often, um, this, our sector is criticized for telling people what to eat, but I really felt that this article of Leighton Bloomberg was telling people what to eat, and it was taking opportunity and choice away from them. Let the person just decide. Like Arena was saying, sometimes you walk into a birthday party and you have birthday cake. Sorry, it's not a health food. I went to a party. I apologize. I mean, whatever. Like you should be able to have choice. Sometimes it's a salad and sometimes it's, you know, plant-based meat and sometimes it is actual meat. Whatever. That's up to the consumer. Let them choose. What do you guys think about that anti-consumer thought? I mean, I, I like choice, right? But I think sometimes we need to guide the choice because mm -hmm. when you have so much choice and you have no other information... We're also like not cerebral people when it comes to food, right? We make food emotionally. Uh, most of our food decisions are made emotionally, like what's in front of me, what's delicious, yeah. what I feel like. So if yeah. you don't guide the choice, the choice might just lead you down to the McDonald's route, right? Mm -hmm. It is delicious and it tastes good in the moment. You feel like crap 20 minutes later, but in the moment it feels good. So mm -hmm. I do think it's important that the choice is there, but that it's guided, right? That's why I feel it's important for consumers and for media mm -hmm. to frame this, that meat reduction has to happen, right? We could not consume this much meat for planetary reasons. We could not consume this much meat for broader health reasons, right? And then you say, and we have choices, right? And the choices could be really high welfare, organic, pasture-raised beef, it could be bean burgers and lentils, which are, by the way, no one's ever going to argue with you are not a health food. It could be slightly more processed patties. It could be all the way to high fidelity, impossible beef. Then you have choices. But I think the choices need to be guided with the impact to your health, the impact to the broader environmental health. And I think now we're starting to see people care about how animals are treated, mm -hmm. how workers in the food system are treated. So there's kind of this bigger social environmental justice trend that's coming where people want to know they might not always make the perfectly perfect choice but when they do know i think that could steer their purchasing behavior towards some of these better more sustainable kinder options and i think that's important mm -hmm. yeah education is such a big part of it but as you say they need guided choices jenny who do you think should be guiding or how does that guiding take place and i completely agree with you arena so I've seen enough Teslas at steakhouses to know that <laughs> awareness ain't just it, right? There is an emotional connection to food that we eat. There's also, in my opinion, and I'm sure there's data to back this that will come out soon, 
a trauma response uh, in the way that people are eating. People are eating out of stress and untold amounts of mental health issues out there, right? I think that's connected to a lot of things right now in society. So it's not a rational thing. Now, when it comes to that education piece, we don't have the same trust and authority that we had 50 years ago when the U.S. dietary guidelines rolled out. You know, this was a pre-internet time. There was much higher trust from citizens in their government. We didn't have these theories of chips in, in your burgers and yeah. Bill Gates and pizza and all that crazy stuff. That didn't exist then, really. And so in many ways, I've actually read some papers where people say if the stuff that had happened um, with the, the ozone holes in the 80s happened today, we probably wouldn't solve them because mm. we would have so much infighting um. about what's the real truth that we wouldn't get anywhere. And so that leaves us with this very large black hole where people don't really go to the government for education anymore. They're not necessarily trusting in the institutions. Uh, certainly there is the doctors. I mean, that's a huge piece and doctors get, well, you'd know, Irina, your husband's a doctor. They get very minimal nutrition education. Yeah, four to eight hours, right. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right. So that's one of our last kind of bastions of hope. And they are woefully underprepared to have conversations about nutrition and often have very, you know, poor views of a plant based diet erroneously because they just haven't been educated on it. And so who else can educate? Well, the other place people are getting it is social media, Google. <laughs> You know, that's that's a simple reality. So many people are making their food choices based off of like creators and influencers right now. Mm -hmm. And anybody that's listening right now, if you don't know folks like the Carnivore MD, um, you know, folks like Liver King, these are multi-million, you know, follower type accounts where they are reaching people all over the world and giving them fake information about red meat and the benefits of red meat right now. And that's the piece that I think has really been missing so much in this industry is we haven't built as much of a culture around, um, you know, that community of influential people all over that can talk um, to their audiences about these meals. One example I'll give you is Tabitha Brown. We're talking about how plant-based meat is dead. Two weeks after Tabitha Brown had a national sold out collection of plant-based meat, uh, many of them, that launched in Target. How can mm -hmm. we hold both truths at the same time? What is different? Because you have different audiences. And That's money. Money. Guess yeah. what? All these multi-million dollar accounts and TikTok. They're bought. Influencers, they're bought, right? And, you know, I've been around consumer brand marketing. It costs millions of dollars. And unfortunately, what we have is a David versus Goliath situation where you have a multi-trillion dollar industry yeah. versus a handful of startups that are trying to, you know, exist and make their product against, you know, all odds on the market being rigged where they, you know, their competitor doesn't pay for externalities, where they have extreme subsidies, where they have economies of scale, right? So just to compete fairly is very, very hard. When you see, and I agree with you, Jenny, this kind of death of expertise, people mm -hmm. don't want to read behind a click, right? Beyond a tweet. Um, and, we have the information, we have the science, we have the data, and yet nobody's engaging with it. And where people are engaged is on these social media accounts. They yeah. cost a ton of money. And our industry is completely outgunned. So is honestly a whole food plant-based movement, right? We've been trying for decades. There are amazing books and studies and doctors and you know people who spent their lives understanding health and nutrition They've been at it for decades. And where have we gone? Like nowhere, really. People are getting sicker and the planet is getting more polluted. So the problem, I think, is that a lot of the time when media picks up, let's you know, circle back a little bit, is that these are not in it, right? The fact that meat is an unsustainable industry, the amount of damage that it's doing, that this must be solved, that it's not a health food, that all had to have been included in that article to say, look, folks, this is one of the solutions, right? And maybe it's not perfect in its current iteration, but it must go on and we must include other solutions. And let's talk about what those are instead of just saying, well, it's dead, throw in the hat and uh, let's all go back to doing whatever we were doing.
There's a, a, a lot there, I think, you know, this information cycle of um, influencers and getting your media or data or your beliefs through social media, and then these social media influencers are paid millions of dollars to say rhetoric from whatever side has the money, and that would be, in our case, the big meat industry, but um, many similar industries are a David and Goliath situation like we are. I think, and I'm surprised to say this, but an outlet like Bloomberg is wanting to find those kind of clicks and that kind of um, virility, viral, <laughs> viral um, growth on social media. And so that keeps the really good information, the at least unbiased, double-sided information coming into an article like that. So it's worrisome that there we don't have the experts that we can go to. And even the experts we do go to get four to eight hours of education on nutrition. And, and obviously that's just not enough. You know, nuance is boring. Right, nobody yeah. likes nuance. It's That's just boring. boring, and it takes focus. Who's read the IPCC report, yeah. right? Yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in like a government panel on climate change. Um, and so that that's the problem, right? And and so the question then for us is, well, where do we go from here? How do we simplify? How do we clarify? How do we build the case for why this needs to exist? But then also, let's fix the issues that we do have with the product. Like you said, Elizabeth, it's a nascent industry. It's three years in, right? So. There's so much product improvement we can and should be doing to make it healthier, to make it tastier, to make it cheaper. That all is coming um, mm -hmm. if we give it the chance to live. And we should be listening to that. I don't want to deny the product as it is, is not perfect, um, but that's okay. It doesn't have to be. Well, I'll just say that, oh, so sorry, Jenny. I had the V3, I guess it would be called, of the Beyond Meat Burger, and it was so damn good. And we're really a step above V2. So, I mean, I think these iterations are coming all the time. Go ahead, Jenny. I just, since we're on this topic and we're talking about don't kill it, I think if anything, anyone that's listening today, if you can take anything from this conversation it's that we're all on the same side of wanting to be here in a hundred years from now in a livable, likable Who's the we? Who's the we in that conversation? In this conversation, I think the we is everybody that's working in this alternative protein space, okay. whether you're making a junkie beyond burger or, I mean, quite honestly, even the people that want to move away from industrial agriculture in whatever ways they want to move away from it, we have been attacking each other. And there's no industry, in my opinion, that is more guilty of it than the plant-based industry. 100%. I can't count how many plant-based founders I see try to attack Beyond and Impossible as a processed meat. Because I've got news for you. To consumers, you're an other. And it doesn't matter if you're a cultivated meat, whether you're a whole food, plant-based, you know, burger, whether you're an impossible burger, you're all an other. You're all you're not an meat. Exactly. You're either meat or you're not meat. And that's, right. that's what you, you're putting yourself, your own category in jeopardy by continuing to perpetuate rumors and misinformation about your competitors. And that is the BS that needs to stop. Yeah. This should be a watershed moment. What's I, I, I talk on this podcast all the time. Sometimes I don't have a guest on it. It's just me. And I talk about how, you know, if you, because I met an airport in Dubai or something, you know, and so it's just me and I do my thing. And I talk about how, if you want to only eat kale, go ahead. But that doesn't mean you should be keeping other people from having the option. I mean, I think of the poor meat eater who, you know, not everyone grew up in a household that you were taught to cook or you got nutrition in school or not everyone has this skill set. And I have nothing but empathy for the meat eater who's like, hey, my doctor told me to cut out red meat. I'm going to try to do the best I can. And they work in impossible or beyond once or twice a week. Why shouldn't that person have that option? And so I hate to see coming from the meat industry or the plant-based industry, I hate to see them close the door on the choice for that, that meat eater. So what are we talking about in terms of a sector? Both of you, I want to hear your top three things that you'd like to see from the sector, starting with Arena, going to Jenny, top three things that you'd like to see from the sector to move forward, because maybe this is a blessing in disguise. First of all, I think I want to see more empathy and understanding toward the mm. consumer and where they are. Um, don't just be in denial and saying, this is the most delicious, most healthiest, best thing ever, right? Let's, let's have a little dose of honesty because I think consumers are seeing that and they're calling BS. 
So that's number one is, is don't overpromise. Um, it's, I think it's okay to not be perfect. And it's okay to say, look, this is not a health food, right? This is a treat. I don't want you to eat it three times a day. I want you to eat it once a week and be okay with it, right? The other one I agree with Jenny is this myopic kind of my world view or mm -hmm. nobody's is that's got to stop. And it's both ways it goes within the plan-based sector, but it's also, I think, to a broader ecosystem because what we're seeing is most consumers don't want to have a kind of a, a all or nothing approach to their food, right? They want to be maybe mostly plant-based or they want to be yeah. a weekday vegan, vegan and they don't want to feel judged. And I think that there's a lot of judging and accusation of either you're with us or you're against us, whichever way that is. And I think we as an industry would be better served by allowing uh, more nuanced, more quieted down, more kind of let's meet people where they are uh, mm -hmm. approach and not be judging them for where they are today. But also, I think the third thing I would say is, I don't think we've built a strong case in consumers' minds behind the why. And oh, do I don't hard. actually, you know, judge so harshly the media, because I think the media are a reflection of where people are, where plant-based was really started as a health trend, as a health food. And now with the plant-based meat, if it's parody, not really healthier, then what is the case? And the case is really sustainability. It's really moving away from factory farming and the treatment of animals and the social justice things. And I don't think many consumers understand that. Um, and I don't think they're very clear in their conviction, even those who do understand it. So I think we need as an industry to do a better job of telling consumers in the media, why is it important that we do these things? And then you can offer them choices and say, you could do this, 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 or the other thing. But we really need this fundamental shift. Okay, let's hear it from Jenny because I've got some. I've got some. I'm not so sure about that. I, let's hear it. Okay. Jenny. Well, first off, I mean, we're. I think I'd say Impossible and Beyond could advertise themselves being child slave free. So we've already got that like up on the other <laughs> industry because that's the reality of it. Yeah. Let's be yeah. serious. Let's be serious. To so Irina's point, health is a flimsy why. And there's going to be people that come for health and they're probably not going to come for a beyond or an impossible burger, but there's an entire other echelon of compelling reasons. And I want to see this year more than anything, the social justice element, the, what we've been able to do with other movements galvanizing around and boycotting industries, like seeing the human piece of it, because there's a real toll to human beings and what's going on right now. You would think the JBS, you know, human trafficking investigation of, of children as young as 13 years old would have really turned people's attention, but it didn't. And I think that's a piece that other than that Oxfam report um, a few years ago, I don't think has really been uh, covered very well. So eating a plant-based meat, it's the right thing to do from a justice perspective. And that needs to be a part of it. And that's a part of what Tabitha Brown does really successfully. You know, she grew up in one of those towns near where much of the hog farming and the poisoning of the black communities are. That's where she's from. She's seen it. That's her why. There's a lot of other things that we can be doing to build the case. Uh, the other thing I would say, of course, is we do definitely need to put down whatever infighting we're doing with each other and come together and coalesce together. And we need to also be clear together on the, on the points because industries win when they have the same talking points and they're boiled down precisely. And you hear the same thing over and over and over again. That's how you win a campaign. That's how you win an election. That's how you win a consumer as well. That repetition is very important. And I think we've taken it for granted. Mm -hmm. And I guess the third point that I would say is I think we've got a lot of room for for folks to come into the space from different technologies. I mean, Irina, you're not a plant based company, right? Um, I think there's going to be a lot of hybrids and things like that that are coming out. Certainly all of the cultivated meat products that are going to come out will all be mostly plant based to start. And let's navigate that carefully and let's make sure that we're also aligned as an industry, because my fear is those products are going to get hit by us in plant based even more than beyond it possible. And we can't let that happen. That's wrong. Yeah. Right. I love it. So, so much great stuff to uncover here. I'll say I mostly agree with both of you, but I think I ultimately, and I won't repeat your points. They're great points, but I think I ultimately think 
as much as um, I personally believe in social justice and the environment and these whys, which are undeniable because the planet is now dependent upon them, most people don't have time to think about these things. Again, the single mother of three who just needs to make dinner for her kids and move the heck on. And so most people think about themselves and they have to get that hurdle covered first. So I think we need to work on price, which I know we all are as an industry, and we need to work on taste. And that has to come. And I think once you have price parity, most people just buy what's cheap. I mean, I'd love to say they're having these conversations like we're having, but they're just not. So if we think it's only 7% of people are getting their vegetables, I think even fewer people are talking about maybe the social justice food security issue. Right now, the animal agriculture industry uses so much land and water that you're not going to be able to feed 10 billion people by 2050 because you can barely feed 8 billion people on the planet. We're going to 10 billion, but you're not getting more land and you're not getting more water. And as we've just seen wars will be fought over food and water. So, you know, these are undoubtable must do's right now, change our food supply system to be more efficient so that we can feed more people and bring down greenhouse gas emissions. I just don't know that everybody thinks that way. So I think of price and um, taste. And then, of course, we have to get on common messaging. There's so look at all the things we've talked about today. So many common messaging between all of the plant based brands and and even not the plant based brands, maybe even the Maple Leafs of the world, which is a meat company out of Canada, which also is deeply invested into the plant based space in a real way, not a minor way with um, brands like Field Roast and Light Life and ADM and, and you know, other other um, industries, uh, companies that straddle both sectors. I think they're interesting here. Mm -hmm. And then I think it would be good to acknowledge that what is a trend? So a trend is something that is adopted over the long haul. And if you look at the stats from not the plant-based foods industry, but Boston Consulting Group and Bloomberg itself, both predict that in about 10 years, we'll be at a tipping point, Synthesis Capital and Rethink X also believe this, we'll be in a tipping point where about 10% of the market will shift over because of price parity and taste and, and maybe beliefs as well. And you'll have a trend in time. So a fad isn't determined by one journalist in one moment in time, but it's in looking at the growth that we've already had now since 2018. You know, that growth is still there. It's just not there as compared to 2020, but it's definitely there as compared to when it started in 2018. So I think when you recognize that all three stakeholders want the same thing, governments, because of the wars over food and water, individuals for their health, and um, industry. I think ultimately meat is going to come around. They need a better business bottom line. Um, so I think all of the three stakeholders want the same thing, and that's an undeniable trend because you have too much push in one direction. Mm -hmm. Last word from you guys. What do you think about what I said? And then I'm starting with Jenny. What do you think about what I said? And what is your prediction for the sector in the next five and 10 years? Well, the next five and 10 years, I think we're going to have hybrid products um, become part of the regular consumer diet, certainly in North America. Um, I think that we are going to see price parity matched in certain protein categories, certainly some of the higher priced ones. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are tackling like high end Wagyu beefs and things like that. Uh, we could very easily meet those. I also think that we will have we're going to have Gen Zers in a major buying position. We already do have them and they think and act very, very differently. And there is a lot of storms that you can weather if you build brand loyalty. So if we do this correctly in the plant-based space, we can ride the Gen Z high with them. Yeah. Love it. Arena, next five and 10 years. I'm going to go optimistic on you. Um, I think, first of all, plant-based is here to stay. Not because we want it to, but because it has to. Um, given the population growth, the climate change, right? The climate is affecting food. Food's affecting climate, but climate is affecting food in a very, very real way. And the fact that we have this massive rising middle class in Africa and India and Asia Pacific that is demanding these higher protein foods, right? And, and the tastes are evolving. We are literally at this mathematical impossibility. We cannot continue to use these legacy systems and continue to supply 50% more products. So just given the, the math and the earth boundaries, I think it dictates that protein sources get diversified. And that I think to me includes whole food plant-based, just veggies, uh, you know, plant-based options in a gamut uh, spectrum, right? From, from the healthiest to maybe the, the most treat-like and some animal foods. And, you know, my hope is that 
now that we are seeing Gen Zs really actually caring quite deeply about the environment and are connecting the dots between not just their fossil fuel and energy habit, but also between their food habit. And we have these technologies that are scaling, that are getting so much better. Just look at the progress. Five years ago, a version of plant-based burger was a bean burger. Now we have impossible. Five years from now, it's going to be healthier. It's going to be more nutritious. It's going to have more fiber and vitamin B12 and you name it. And it will be more delicious and it will be prosperity. So we cannot look at this exact little nascent moment in time and make any conclusions. I think it's going to continue to develop. It's not going to be a slam dunk, but I see the growth accelerating 100% in the future. Yeah, I do as well. I'll say that in the next five years, I guess that would be 2028, we will be long beyond price parity. That will have happened already in five years. And we'll start to see mass adoption such that in 10 years, that would be uh, 2033, we will have more than a 10% tipping point. And it will be a, a fait accompli, not because we're bragging or we're sort of over um, optimistic, but just because the current system we have doesn't work. So that's just, it. The current, just, it just doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, that's it. Just, just. Uh, so with that, then our current food supply system no longer serves us and does not work for us, even though, hey, we all grew up on meat, but whatever, no longer working. And I'm so grateful to the people who are innovating for change so that we can all continue to live on the planet because it really does boil down to just about that. Um, so I'm grateful to all the brands who are not giving up. Stop attacking each other. Let's move forward. We have so much tailwind because of all of the environmental reasons that we've discussed today. We have so much tailwind. Um, and ultimately, when you make it cheap enough, people will buy it, I believe. So that's a win for everybody, animals, people, planet. I want to thank Irina Gary for being with me here today. Jenny Stojkovic, so great to have you with me, both of you. We should do this again. If you guys have the bandwidth, we should do it like every six months, just an industry update on where we are, what we think, what we're seeing. Um, both of you, I'm so grateful for your perspectives. Go find them on LinkedIn, everybody. Irina Gary's Chief Marketing Officer of Change Foods and Jenny Stoykovich, the founder of Vegan Women's Summit. Everybody, thank you for being with me today. Folks on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook, I will see you all next Tuesday. Bye, everybody. YouTube, don't go away. Everybody else, see you next week.